Hey, what's up? So, you know, full disclosure, I've been getting pretty good with the technology, but this is still, uh, this is still new to me, especially Zoom. So, you know, bear with us, bear with me, because this is still, this is my first time hosting one of these. So, excellent. Okay, so first up, right, is Kathy Engel. We recently published Kathy Engel's poetry collection, The Lost Brother Alphabet beautiful uh, collection of remembrance. I'm going to read an abbreviated bio, okay, um, just uh, for the sake of time, okay, but I want to make sure I get the important things, a lot of important things in here. So Kathy Engel is a poet, she's an essayist, she's an educator, and she's co-founder of numerous organizations and projects, including Madre, the International Women's Human Rights Group founded in 1983, which she directed for five years. She's an associate arts professor in NYU's Tisch School of the Arts. Uh, I had the pleasure recently of visiting her classroom and it was so much fun. Those kids are gonna, they're gonna change the world. Um, I'm trying to get them to come work for me, <laughs> to come work with me, not for me, with me, because I am not a capitalist. Um, and so let's see what happens, right? Uh, she's, I, I said that part already. Kathy's poem to Neil is published at The Root and is read by Danny Glover, Anna Devere Smith, and a chorus of other artists in support of the 2018 NFL protest and the right to dissent against racist police violence. It's beautiful. Please go there and check it out. Uh, but more than that, please pick up a copy of The Lost Brother Alphabet. Um, it made my heart sing because it, while, while it is part elegy, I, I strongly believe that elegies are part ode as well. And, um, you know, they tell a story of love. And so there's, there's a little bit of everything in that book for everyone. So please um, check it out. Kathy wanted everybody to know that, that she really has a problem choosing which poem she's gonna read or choosing uh, anything actually. And uh, having worked with her as an editor on her book, yes, she does have a bit of a hard time choosing sometimes. Pew, 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 right? Uh, <laughs> uh, mad love. Everybody, please welcome Kathy. Uh, show her some love. Um, I'm really happy to be here. I'm really grateful to you, Roberto, to the whole Get Fresh team, and just to be part of this uh, beautiful, brave, important community of poets. Uh, it just uh, makes things possible. So thank you uh, so much. And I'm honored to be reading with such amazing poets. I uh, also in the spirit of acknowledgement and honoring and also giving thanks and thinking about this week also, but uh, I want to acknowledge the land where I am, uh, which is the land of the Shinnecock people, the land and waters of the Shinnecock tribe, and uh, to honor the ancestors, past, present, and future. And um, my dear friends uh, of the Shinnecock Nation are just now coming to the close, Thursday will be the close of a several week sovereignty camp. Um, to uh, honor grave sites, sacred grave sites. So I just want to acknowledge and pay tribute. Okay, I'm reading so many books and I skitter and scatter around because I have trouble choosing. Um, or just because I love so many books, but the one I decided to mention tonight is Undrowned. I'm gonna hold it up by Alexis Pauline Gums. Uh, if you don't know her work, I invite you, I implore you, I think you're going to have an amazing experience. This is called Undrowned Black Feminist Lessons from Marine Mammals. And I'm going to read you like three sentences, okay? The leopard seal is not afraid of you. She is not afraid of you. She never was. She remains a mystery to you. You would have to study her on her own terms and you don't know how yet, it's okay. You can admit you've been afraid of how she knows exactly who she is. So hopefully that entices you to Undrowned. Um, it was really hard, not mention five other books, but next time. 
uh, I'm going to read a few poems. Um, been thinking about my dad a lot lately. Well, I always do, but I've been thinking about him a lot. And I wasn't going to read this poem, but now I'm going to because you'll see why. I wrote this in 2000. What year was that? Eight, I think. It's called, and it's it was right after my dad passed. And uh, right at, at the time, right after the inauguration of Barack Obama, the first time. Dad, Pete, and Obama. When Pete sang at the Lincoln Memorial, I called to Ash. I had played Pete as your last breath slipped out, the rest of you already gone. Pete ushered you, your hero sang for the man whose name you spoke the week you died. Obama, you said, sipping water. I believe something is happening, don't you? Pete, with his grandson who lived in Nicaragua, the country we loved in its burning birth. Pete, who wouldn't testify. Pete, civil rights. Pete, peace. Pete, 1199. Pete, this land. Pete, Clearwater. Pete and Toshi. Pete and brother Kirkpatrick. Pete and June reading poems at the UN rally circa 1983, Pete the unwavering for all who were taken, all who picketed and as Pete said, for the young people who taught us not to be afraid those Montgomery sit-in days, Pete in his power, in the place of power, suspenders and banjo, train chug of workers belting out a new old gusty day, ghosts of resistance swaying past the monument, feeding the hungry crowd. This day when Pete sang at the Lincoln Memorial, I called to you who took a bus alone to DC at 80 to protest. I called to your ash dad who took me there first. Of course, I forgot that I was supposed to talk about the book because I was so excited to <laughs> read from my dad. So now I'll talk about the book and um, just afterwards to say that Pete is Pete Seeger, June is June Jordan, brother Kirkpatrick was one of the original freedom singers and Toshi was, is, was Pete's uh, wife. I think those are the references. So this book um, was really 13 years I think in coming because it was one book and then there was a sequence, which is the title, uh, which I gave the title of the book, The Lost Brother Alphabet, which came later, and that was going to be its own book. And that none of it was quite, 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 quite. And so then there was a book of the elegies, the Lost Brother poems and the Father poems, and then the other poems that are whatever you would call them. And someone said, maybe it's one book. And then... I had sections and someone said, maybe mix them up, you know? And so uh, I, it was just such a long process of different parts of, of my writing and my life, but that seems to be the way it goes with me. And then um, Roberto seemed to think for the most part <laughs> that, that that's, how it goes, but the, the thing is the Lost Brother Alphabet is the title is the title of a sequence that's woven throughout the book. And I made that choice to weave those poems, to separate them and weave them. And all except one or two of those poems start, are titled with a letter of the alphabet and have that letter and that sound throughout that poem. So that's enough about the book. Uh, I'm gonna read just a couple of, of poems. Um, return. The animals camp out in the farm of my body, a field of muscle, fat, and bone, sea of nerves. They mend my vessels, sew back my arteries, sing my stutter, gallop my missteps. First a horse, then the others claim their places. Even snakes and insects swivel and swarm. I thought the rupture within was all a human thing. The mother, the father, the lost girl. Now I understand. 
the earth itself is calling and the animals, buried, scattered, those who rise, snort, bellow, murmur, hiss, their hooves, wings, fins, and tentacles, seed the soil, repair the soul. And this is one of the Lost Brother poems. F has an epigraph from Leo Tolstoy's Anna Karenina. All happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Anna Karenina. Tolstoy got it wrong. What is a happy family? Today's lesson, F. Brother as friend, fiend. You forgot to leave my dream, just walked in last night like a cowboy, then fled again. I fortify, fortify. Here's another of the lost brother. More S, there was an S or two S's, this is more S. My brother uh, took his life in 2011 after long struggles with uh, physical pain and illness and addiction. More S, still for you I crave some, some, some sweet, not shifty, not shut, not shafted or shafting, that sea we soaked. I want to suck out your shame, the sour, the scary, the sold self, salute your soul. I am your sister, here is my salt. Too late, this salve. This is called text message. I find it. Mm, text message from best friend in Buffalo. And it's kind of a found poem. Uh, the epigraph is the text message in the poem. Text message from best friend in Buffalo. So the epigraph, the text. Off the coast of Florida, a beached mother whale died and the calf will be euthanized. What have we done? We off, we coast, we beach, we mother, we whale. We died, we calf, we will, we be, we euthanize, we what, we have, we done. Now I pray. Ashen face, wool hat bobbing, the young boy's eyes dart to me then up at the man pulling a rolly suitcase, whose hand he holds, then back at me. His legs move as if without gravity. The man asks, do you know a church on this street that serves free food? I want to say I know that the names of churches on an avenue called America's roll out of me. I want to tell you it is temporary, their condition, suitcase, darting eyes, seeking free food at 9 p.m. in a big city on a school night. I want to tell you I don't for a moment wonder if that is really the boy's father or uncle or legitimate caretaker, something in the hand holding an eyes, having watched too many episodes of law and order. I want to tell you I take them to a restaurant and pay for a warm meal or empty my wallet, not worrying how offensive that might be because in the end, hunger is hunger. I want to tell you I call someone who loves them, that there is someone and say your guys are lost, can you come? I want to tell you I sit down on the sidewalk at the corner of Waverly and pray that all passing by anonymous shoes marking the pavement Join in a chorus of prayer, humming like cicadas in the Delta. I want to tell you the boy and the man eat food 
encircled by the warmth of bodies. I want to turn the cold night into a feast. I will tell you, I am praying. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Beautiful. Thank you. Go ahead and mute yourselves. And just, ah! uh, right? <laughs> Kathy, beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. Our readings. Gorgeous. Our readings are usually like this big, loud, wild. You know what I'm saying? And uh, um, Kathy, thank you so much. That was beautiful. Um, I know one of the hardest things is to like talk about the book and the process and talk about yourself, but um, you know, I think that's something a lot of folks always want to hear about. You know, one of the first questions I think that people usually ask is, uh, you know, about what went into your book and what were some of the ideas or how did it start and where does it go? So, you know, as I say, in the spirit of giving. Okay, excellent. Next up is Len Lawson, all the way from South Kakalaka. Um, so I'm going to read something a little shorter than the short bio, right? Uh, so we obviously published Chime, Len Lawson's uh, beautiful and wonderful book. One of my colleagues, uh, I was having a conversation with her about the books we're publishing, and I was talking to her about Chime. And she said, I would love to read that. And I obviously, I showed it to her. And she ended up teaching it in her class. And I think Len went to visit the class. So um, I thought, you know, that is so dope, right? That's what I think um, in our model of what poetry is, it's about being in front of people reading uh, and uh, interacting with people because that's how the poetry really connects, right? When you have folks there to engage with. So um, I just wanted to, to share that because I thought that was awesome. So anyway, Lynn Lawson is the author of Chime uh, and the chat book Before the Night Wakes You, also phenomenal. He is also co-editor of Hand in Hand, Poets Respond to Race, uh, Muddy Ford Press, and The Future of Black, Afrofuturism and Black Comics Poetry, and that's forthcoming from Blair Press in 2021. He has taught English in South Carolina higher education for 10 years. Give it up. For Len Lawson. What's up? Hey, y'all. Good evening. Had to get a y'all in there somewhere since I'm from South Carolina. Oh, I'm feeling good. Oh, you forgot to say my um my one thing I want everybody to know, but I'll say it. one thing I want everybody to know is um that it's tough to be comfortable with myself. I think that's the abbreviated version of what I was going to say. But uh, yeah, it's a been a lifelong process. So I'm still learning how to do that. And I imagine I'm still going to be doing that until I leave this, this earth. So there's that. Um, shout out to Ms. Maxwell's class. That was a uh, fun experience to talk to the bright young people. Um, so good when you get to talk about your work and other, gets other people excited about your work. But um, I'm going to get going. Um, the book I want to discuss is um, Tyree Day's Cardinal. So Tyree Day is a poet from North Carolina, just up the road a piece. But, um, you know, his, his poetry just ignites something in me that makes me want to write more about like Southern stuff, like sitting on a back porch, drinking lemonade and, you know, watching coons run through your backyard and all kinds of stuff like that. He's like, when I get to be like a real poet, then maybe I'll be able to write like that. But, um, and then he's just like, so like, docile and gentle with it but his themes are just so profound um so i just want to open up with one poem and then uh go into some of mine that i think are kind of speaking to this one this one is called um ode to small towns in his book uh cardinal this where all the roadside memorials are pink wreaths 
and dirty teddy bears. This where a man walked when he wanted to fly. This where he laid down and later died. This where the train tracks folded the town in half. This where that man who died loved a woman. That's his heart. You hear, not the train. This where I ran the dream colored woods and did not know why. This where I believe a dog is buried. This where I danced in the long moonlight of a field. This where a woman planted ghost peppers. This where she thinned her blood with root water. This where you can see the whole town. This where the moon never goes. This where my grandmother hid some dreams. This where my dead may have met. This where they'll bury me. This where I shot a bird from smoke smelling sky. This where it fluttered, fell. It's just a gut punch and I just want to go somewhere and hide for a little while. <laughs> Contemplate my whole life, just running through that whole poem. It, and it just like makes me want to write more. So um, love his work. So I'm going to start from my book, Chime, which came out last year. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see invisible applause. Um, it was a beautiful experience to work with uh, Get Fresh and all you guys that I see here um, saying great things about it and encouraging me. Um, the book is just sparked from um, poems that I was writing about like uh, black bodies and uh, wanting to see something uh, more beautiful or better in black bodies than them just dying, especially in the last like five years or so. So. Um, I actually have some poems related to the, the body, especially bodies of color, but and I'll get to some of those, but I wanna um, read this first one that I think kind of speaks to that Tyree Day poem and it's called um, Down South. Down South, five and dime, antique store, cash and carry, drug store, barber shop, shoe shop, record store, bridal boutique, dive bar. You're on your knees digging through the catacombs of small business, all hemorrhaging green. The law of the South says you can't get blood from a turnip. You wish you could flip down transparencies of time to see the old shops in their heyday. When dusty dirt roads exhaled clouds of anticipation, and alleys in the crevices of town felt no pressure to be firm asphalt. Up north, the empty buildings are called abandoned. Down here, they look neglected, like the little girl pretending to be a princess of her trailer park, parading with her wand, dancing in her tutu before her uncle's grave. My old barber was a butcher by day. He could chuck away at me like a lumberjack or finesse me like a surgeon. But no one mourned cattle outside his shop or lost knuckleheads like up north. So um, I'm kind of obsessed with place <laughs> and uh, like my place that I've lived my whole life, which is here. So a lot of that comes out in these poems and in my uh, research. So this one is also related. This is called uh, Going to Court in My Hometown. It is morning and no one here takes my face seriously. We are relics one to another. I'm not sure if this place is old or new testament or if it is I who's old or new. I smell embers from something not burning on the outside, but I know hell is near. Underneath my tongue, every time my lips part to curse this ground. I see flames in their flesh, wailing in their eyes. They are the rich man who beseeches Lazarus to place a drop of water on his tongue in his fiery afterlife. I can only drop one tear. 
I recall driving drunk here one night coming to a stop sign with hallucinations of running it to jump my car over train tracks ahead on a hill. Had I gotten stuck in the stars, my dead body would be a god. Today, my limp body is next to my name in a ledger marked paid. I am the corpse of the kid who got hit by a train in Stand By Me. At least I still get to look up at the stars flat on my back. Buzzards will eventually circle by morning. They look away from me as I leave town. I have followed them as far as I can go. So I wanna get into some of these um, body poems that I don't get to read very often. Um, so again, I was just uh, trying to come up with like metaphors or just listening for metaphors of what the body could be like more than just dead. So I'm going to read a few of those. The body is a cave. Bullet hole in the globe. Implode a mountain and echo into the wood. Wet embrace for a warm shake. Open tomb where a messiah once lay. Got up and left his deathbed unmade. This body isn't comfortable for a Christ. Whistle into it and melody cries out bats. As a child, I always covered my eyes in school from the voluptuous body of the word spelunking. A mouth with toothless rancor, the body is a gum hole. Deeply rooted bone once grew here. The body is an eye slammed shut, plucked out because it offends so many, still whistles back its rogue nocturnal creatures. The body is a howling from the unknown in the wilderness, praying to know from what animal it comes. The cave is a body, dark, cold, dead body, Man's finest still bring their best instruments to burst it open and sew it shut, to fear it, to fear losing it inside them. This one is, the body is a door. The body is a door. Um, it has a brief epigraph from one of my beautiful friends that passed away a few years ago, Susan Lauder Myers. And um, I recently was, received a fellowship in her honor in North Carolina. And uh, her first chapbook, she had a poem called, um, well, the, the book of poems was called uh, Le Lessons on Leaving. So I took a line from one of those poems and the line is, every door is a lesson in leaving. The body is a door. The last two letters of the word door indicate an alternative. The first two letters denote an action. Yoda told us like this, do or do not, there is no try. Commanding doors like the master he was saying, door, do not, don't try me. We walk through the word door when we become souls, buildings of flesh and bone. We open our eyes in every morning. If the eyes are the windows to the soul, then why hasn't anyone shown us how to open the door? It really pisses off everyone in the afterlife when we discover there are no doors, only dimensions. The O's in door are simply portals, windows of deja vu where we see in a mirror darkly what we can master on the other side. This body is a dimension, a lesson before death, a firmament to be commanded without a key. So I'm gonna do a couple more of these. Um, let's see what I got time for. <laughs> um, there's a guy from Bangladesh that I went to school with and um, this is somewhat of a true story. And um, two more, Lynn. 
One more? Okay. Two more. We got into a, Two more. Oh, thank you. We got into a, uh, a fight, you know, just because people want to see us fight for some reason. So this is related to that. Battle Royal. Two brown boys in a Carolina wood. White boys meander both. Manifest destiny. White boy says, y'all two should fight. Cock fight, dog fight. White boy knows both are already lost. Two brown boys square off. One from Africa. White boys don't know what tribe. One from Bangladesh. All they see is a Muslim. Two brown boys dance and pivot each other. Alvin Ailey is proud. One with scraped knees bordered by peeled scabs the legacy of whips and shackles. One with sweaty brow mopped by sprouts of hair down to the collar of a black flannel top tucked into acid washed jeans, American history. Two brown boys blistered by white eyes on the sidelines waiting for blood, placing bets, passing the time until the recess bell signals the race to classes, celebrating a blank Age history. They are all the eye of a cyclops, white sclera, trembling brown iris, black pupil taking in light and darkness. Two brown boys stare at each other, then around the white boy ring, then back at each other. Muslim kid advances with a flurry of punches. Black kid blocks, balances the equation. Two brown boys sucking wind Gulps of blood they swallow, slow drip from the American flag above them in the schoolyard. African boy goes in for the kill without spear or dagger. Tackles Muslim kid to the grass, applies headlock. Good enough, he laughs nervously. Cyclops shuts his eye in slumber. Black boy pumps fists in the ominous gray sky. Shouts of tribal euphoria. Glares around the whiteboard ring for approval. Soul open to receive the prize for second class on the schoolyard. No one hoists him on their shoulders. He happy because he beat a Muslim, they say, and hold their aching bellies full of laughs. Birth from guilty pangs a generation ahead. Bell sounds, white boy ring dissolves. Two brown boys left staring into the broken mirror of each other's face. Cyclops won't appreciate its monstrous eye for another generation ahead. Old glory tumbles above to usher in the storm from some foreign land, licks the storm with its own stripes. Brown grass recovers, braces for the storm with a sigh. And I think I'm gonna end right there. So thank you very much. Thank you, Len. Appreciate you, bro. Thank you very much. Woo-hoo! Awesome. Yeah, huh? Len came. There was a bit of an internet kerfuffle recently about uh, metaphors and whatnot. Um, gosh, I thought poets were supposed to be kind. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, uh, but this beautiful, beautiful work. Len was like, huh? Like, <laughs> I peeped that. I peeped that. <laughs> um, thank you, Len. Thank you, everybody. Um, you know, for your reading so far, Kathy, Len. Uh, beautiful stuff. Um, up next uh, is the latest. Um, I don't know. Maybe somebody else defended their dissertation between then and now. But in my mind, is the latest newly minted doctor from Temple University, uh, Darla Himelas. It's so funny when I met Darla, I was like ready to talk to her in Spanish because I was like, Jimeles, that's that's Jimeles, right? She was like, uh, no, it's Jimeles. <laughs> I was like, oh man, I was all right. Um, <laughs> but uh, she's still cool, she's still down. Um, all right, so Darla Jimeles is a PhD, right? She's a doctor, is a poet, translator, and essayist with roots in Los Angeles, Philadelphia, and coastal Maine. Pushcart Prize and Best of the Net nominee. Darla can be read widely online and in print. She's a 2018 K. Patricia Cross Future Leaders Award recipient. 
Darla lives in Philly. Philly brought it home. I took to Darla and said, I don't know if it was you, Darla, but thank you for winning uh, Philly. Uh, <laughs> she lives in Philly with her wife and daughter and is the author of the chat book, Flesh Enough, which get fresh books at the honor of publishing and the forthcoming collection, Cleave, which we're also publishing. That's right. So um, <laughs> everybody welcome. Uh, Darla, Darla wanted all of us to know that a progressive Senate can be ours if we work to turn out the vote in two runoff Senate races in Georgia that are taking place in early January. So if you got that Luciano, the dollars, or if you have volunteer hours to give, Georgia needs you. Uh, and we all need Georgia. Amen. Everybody welcome Darla. Woo. Thank you. Um, I want to talk about this book, Ross Gay's Beholding. Beholding. A few of us in this virtual space had the honor of being Ross's student at Drew University. Oh gosh, you got, got slow just then. Am I still okay? Is the connection okay? Okay. Um, it's a book length poem and it's about a lot of things, but Dr. J. Uh, Julius Irving of Philadelphia, 76ers, who um, defied physics and gravity in 1980. There's a lot of YouTube clips of this amazing move. Um, also a book about interconnection and race and love and timelessness and flying. Um, so I'm just toward each other, ill like a skull, gently, with a knowing our bodies have a tending reaching so far to be, he is crawling when he releases the ball. At last with the wrist twist that makes the orb kiss the glass with what we used to call English. But tonight's forward for the turning toward Doc makes the ball do. Doc in flight makes the ball do. Doc in flight decides to make the ball do. Kissing, let's call it kissing. This endless reaching we do, breathe. Crawling as reaching, like this sometimes makes us be splayed like a star, sprawling, though Irving's crawling is through the air, and as such has the quality of both soaring and swimming, though, if we look closely, Doc has reached already his flight's apex, and the crawling, the reaching, is a way of not falling. The reaching is a way of not falling. Just an incredible book. Um, so this is Flesh Enough. This is my chat book um, that Get Fresh published in 2017. And um, this photo is by a photographer named Don Surratt, whose cover art will be on Cleave too. Um, book is about loss and extinction and Jewishness and family and stuff like that. I'm gonna read one poem that I often read and then a bunch of poems that I never read, just because why not? So, cousin. And I will say that this poem was two pages and Ross Gay made me cut it down. He gave me a line limit and a word limit per line. And he's like, make the poem fit in that space. And it's such a better poem for that. Cousin, you will never rip apart the hala, warm and wrapped in Malaysian linen, while my wife holds the other end in our home. When we met, your back locked. Between your vertebrae are traditions I have craved, secretly kissing mezuzahs and doorways and stumbling through the Shema alone. Our pots and pans are spoiled, cousin, with sins I don't believe in. And when I bleed, I touch everything. Fuchsia. Whole years lumber sometimes, heavy-footed, unpoachable, encircled by armed guards, like the last male northern white rhino, until the thick knees buckle and the beast bows to beige earth. Sometimes silence breathes heavy between siblings. She tells me she never took out the trash those years mom worked three jobs and I went east. We shoo the grass beside the old apartment, he asks again whether the cars plow into a palm tree or the heart attack killed our stepfather. And what of those post-mortem letters dropped through the slot? 
The rhinoceros no longer is horned, nothing left to harvest. Those years have bowed to the earth. We pluck fuchsia at our smashed petals down the walk. So um, just got that PhD and it took a long time. And during those long years, I, thank you. <laughs> I wrote some poems about the, um, the white guy masters and some of those poems made it into this book. And this one's called, um, Charles Bernstein is a Philadelphia based poet. Um, you all, do you all know who he is? I didn't really know who he was before I started at Temple, but he's this really experimental, um, very beloved pen based poet listening to Charles Bernstein read essays while I have a migraine. Bernstein aura pulses as he damns convention. My poems have lips and slip across bodies. My poems would bore him. My brain paints him in glow motion. My brain wants him to be my friend, to like my poems. In another field, we cross leg with Coleridge, bees licking clover by our feet and hands. We all smoke pipes, we are friends. In another field, Bernstein scribbles love poems unironically. And Penn is a friendly place. And it is 1970s and Coleridge always lies with us barefoot and Bernstein pulses, pulses, pulses my, as my eyes close, as my body lifts, as my legs carry me out into blinding orange sun, weeping and stumbling into late, late sun. Blue crab. And what if T.S. Eliot had been a crab scuttling across the ocean floor? No sinister greased middle part, no shovel to bury Shakespeare, that possible imposter. But maybe the Earl of Oxford did bleed his longings into those sonnets, Hamlet, Desdemona. And maybe Eliot should have been a blue crab. No yellow fog, no women talking Michelangelo. To think he could have been an ordinary poet, like all crabs, pincering out meter in Joe Fruscioni's lucky busted up trap, or sizzling his love song in red broth, Baltimore crockpot, scuttling iambic, trochaic in death. The poem features a uh, mosasaur. It's called Kansas. Overhead, a boy shark thrashed in Tylosaurus pro rigors grip, tail fin blasting brown gold algae through tropical water in a time before hours in a now vanished sea. Listen with me how the ground thrums these warm Cretaceous secrets. Cheek the chalky dust, hip the yellow grass. Eons ago, a dark body buckled within a more powerful body. Eons ago, my breathless headlights cheeked your midnight street. Listen, as if what thrashes within untouchable hours would speak within invisible sea at Temple, my friend Talissa Ford, and she has a bust of William Blake in her office. And this is called On Encountering William Blake's Head in Talissa Ford's Office. Talissa blames his apparent anger on nose straws placed before the plaster set into sunken cheek and lip. The strain of narrow breath immortalized in the dead poet's life mask. Our four hands splay across his baldness as she passes him. The weight startles. He could be my stepfather, Eyes closed above the fading body folded deep in an orange vinyl chair. I slip fingers into a rough crack in his neck, cradled in my lap. His jowl and brow hairs take my breath. She has another of him at home, she says, intact. I'm gonna read one poem um, from Cleve, which is, a um, revision of my MFA thesis from a million years ago. And I'm so grateful to get fresh books for giving it a home. It's a book, um, it's, about, it's about lesbian love and marriage. It's about the legacies of domestic violence and it's about transformation. And this poem is called Breach and it, content warning does deal with sexual violence. Um, 
And it looks like this, it's a weird looking poem. So I just want you to see it on the page. Breach. Trust your stomach and thighs clenching. That dank room with its round bed and two small window births only dead end flashbacks. Self as teenage Olympia with choker and pinched nipples. A hollowed peach fuzz belly into which he pours molten wax. Into which he pours and pours. Frosted window glass, the light murky and viscous. Billy Idol's white wedding floods the parentless air. Body bent then like a seven. Maybe what happens next must. And so the breach will spasm for years. And so the mind will blank behind the dungeon door thrust shut. No lover will glance that tender skin without your legs and back jerking. You buck cloven hooved, then fawn, eyelashes slow through hyperventilation, face and feet numb. 14 years old, your puffed eyes trace stucco constellations. Child, you've done nothing wrong. Here, climb those dusty milk crates, slip this way, deep breath beneath window glass. No ears can hear or eyes grip us. It's been 23 years. Wait till you see how our someday beloved slick hands knead cocoa butter into our cracked souls, how breezes blow crisp, sweet through our future rooms, vanilla, coffee, lavender. Thank you. <laughs> hey! Hey! There you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Carla. God love. Fire, 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 fire. Uh, thanks, Jesse. Awesome, awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, all right. Up next. Come up next. Ready, ready? Ready, ready, ready? Uh, Mercy Tellus Bukhari. It's a poet essayist and fiction writer who focuses on the woman, woman's experience through individuality, motherhood, and sexuality. She's published two books of poetry, Smoke through Blind Beggar Press and Mango through Ocean Taste Publications. Mercy was named one of eight authors bringing Afro-Latina stories to the forefront by Jeremescla and was a Pushcart Prize nominee for her essay, Black Dolls for Everyone. Mercy teaches high school English language arts in the southeast section of the Boogie Down. If you don't know what the Boogie Down is, don't even ask me no questions. I'll even <laughs> talk to you. Um, and is completing her first novel. And she currently lives in New Rochelle, New York with her two children. Fun fact about Mercy that I learned recently, you didn't uh -oh. know. I, mean, uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> I, stay, I stay up on everybody's, you know, Facebook pages and stuff. You don't see me, but I'll be out there. Mercy's dad is named Roberto. Yep. Right? <laughs> Serendipity. And my brother. And her brother, see? We are publishing Mercy's collection titled right now, The Little Deaths I Barely Have. Get ready for that, because you're not ready. Get ready, right? Um, thank you, Mercy. Yes, <laughs> let's get down. Everybody, Mercy. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Roberto. And um, so since you already shared the fun fact, I don't need to share another fun fact, right? We good, right? Yes, the more fun facts, the better. We're all about that here. What do you mean? So... <laughs> So, you know, I forgot to think of one. So I was like, oh, I got a good fun fact. So um, I'm I'm a yoga teacher and I write erotica. And as you know, from my um, from the bio, I write a lot about the body and the woman's body and so forth. And and one thing that I, I, I say when I teach yoga is that um, and this is a fun fact that I'm going to share with everyone <laughs> is that our our body gives us tons of pleasure in so many ways. And, and, and I think it's important being in isolation to understand that and accept that. Just like 
you know, just rubbing your shoulders or just giving yourselves like tight hugs or, or even just meditation where you need nothing else. You just need yourself and your body to give you pleasures that no one else can. So I just, that's, I just want to throw that out there and just keep that in mind as we in, in isolation, you know, if you need a little something, just, just reconnect with yourself. <laughs> Good fun fact, right? <laughs> so with that said, <laughs> I, um, I'm going to, um, go into talking about reading about, um, reading from Willie's book, Willy Perdomo, um, Afro-Latino, I know you're a big fan of his, Roberto, and I know he wrote um, a blurb for your book or um, he did something for you. And and um, and yeah, yeah, I like him. You know, I like his work and, and, I, and I like him as a person. So um, I've been thinking a lot about love lately. I'm divorced. I'm in a relationship, a new relationship. I have my children and just you know, just my daughter just looked up and smiled. <laughs> and, and, you know, just really, and I reconnected with my niece also who's watching right now. So I've just been thinking about love, just the definitions of love, welcoming love, you know, that's going along with taking care of your body, right? That body giving you that pleasure that you need, right? And, and, and it's an emotional need as well, love. So um, I'm going to read this poem from Shorty Bomb Bomb. That's about, um, that's going into that idea of love. Maybe under some other sky. Ask me poet, did I love her? Breast against bristle, penny eyes. I love rose the way fours exchange blows, the way fractures need islands, the way we tremble in the glow of dead ass truth. You wanted to stay away just to see the end with her. Guardian, gladiator, and goon, skeleton to ash, speak, dead, forget always, ask, uh, ask me again, did I love her? With holy mouth and hard hand, I play like I say, yes, yes, I did. So that's my book, the book that I'm going, that I'm reading. And so now I'm going to read from, from um, the little deaths I barely have. So the process of that is just, you know, just thinking about my aging and, and my womanhood as I'm aging. So reflecting on that with truth and honesty and, and, and figuring out my role in this world as a mother, as a lover, as a teacher, um, as I'm, as I'm aging, as I'm, as the, the gray hairs are popping out as the wrinkles are coming up as as the mammogram <laughs> appointments are are showing up just you know just this whole idea of oh my gosh this is these are things my mom used to do right that i remember my mother following up on and now i am that person so um what does that mean for me you know what does that mean for me in terms of my existence in this world and especially this year i turned 45 so it's it's this whole and I know I'm still young, but but yet I'm I'm in another age bracket, and and um and my 82 year old father did tell me, "Damn, you are old." <laughs> so of course it's like, oh yeah, okay, Dad, yeah. So let's get into the poem. So the poems I'm going to read, I purposely chose poems that that show growth. So I'm starting from my childhood, and I'm going into my adolescence. And then I'm going into my aging as well. And I'm going to end with a poem about my brother, which I love reading. I love reading this poem. And so I just going, want to re end it with this, this um, place of passion and respect for my brother's memory. This one's called La Gringa's First Ride to Los Hondos. Esta gringa flew to Honduras when she was five years old on the lie that she was going to meet Mickey Mouse because esta gringa could not stop crying while boarding this monstrous sized thing that was supposed to stay afloat high in the air. We flew from Kennedy Airport into clouds and over pineapple plantations and banana fields, cows roaming and campesinos working, sand and beaches con hondos strong as the ancestors pre pleading from esta grown gringa to grow, go back. When we landed, esta gringa asked, well, where's Mickey Mouse? Because of course, 
Mickey Mouse should be waiting for esta gringa on the tarmac. Her mommy ignored the question. She pushed, pushed her past the initial slap of hot, humid air, took her down the aircraft stairs, walked her across the tarmac into the building of the airport. We searched for our suitcases in a room where suitcases were thrown at random places on the floor. We were like roaches scattering when the light goes on, looking for our bags, yelling across the room. Encontré otra when we found the bag. Mommy, slipping a $10 US bill to the woman who manually checked the suitcases we found, patted the top of the tightly packed items of clothes and soaps and shoes and more clothes and unknown duct tape packages from Tia Melba y Tia Lorna y Tia Carmen, all of who weren't really mis tias, Fawelita, Fulano y Fulano y Fulano. We had to return to the airport the following week for one missing suitcase, esta gringa playful polito barefooted on the sand that was her soil. Within the confused gaze of the neighbors, esta gringa swam in the sand of granules and poured buckets of sand on her head. Esta gringa washed the sand off her body in the big sink behind the house, the same sink her mommy used to hand wash her clothes. Esta gringa chased chickens around the house, danced punta, ate la comida of split coconuts, and heard her mommy yell to curious passerbys, con orgullo. Ella es una gringa, ciudadana americana. Esta gring, grown gringa looks back at a time when gringa status actually mattered. Esta gringa watched a garifuna man walk to a canoe with a net, come back to shore with fish in his net. She watched a garifuna woman take a fish from that net, scrape the scales of that fish, split it open, salted, and fried the fish con aceite de coco. Her mommy squeezed lime on the fried fish, y tajadas. Esta gringa ate fried fish con tajadas for lunch. Gracias a Dios, Columbus said that Honduras saved his lost ass from the depths of the storm. Y esta gringa was saved from a contrived fantasy world of fake believed dreams and a minstrel mouse. All right. <laughs> so um, the next one is called Peacock. Um, little known fact, another little known fact, peacocks are males, thus, the last part, cock, right? Some people think that peacocks are, are females because they're so beautiful and they have the big, you know, but no, they're males, right? They're like that because they're trying to attract the females. The females look very plain and simple. You know, they're called peahens. <laughs> so little fact, peacock. I'm still that child wearing peacock feathers. I was not supposed to be. Conceived out of purposefully missed birth control pills that placed shackles on a man who wanted an out. Yet I'm not the most consistent myself. Bonds are as minimal as the everyday with no grounding of earth, chance, love. I still venture into family grounds to find brothers and sisters who lack the native tongue and experiences and an interest in peacocks. All right, so I'm getting a little older here. 1940 University ha Avenue Holy Spirit School, the Bronx, the gym. So this is an old to my to the elementary school I went to on University Avenue in the BX. It was a small school, Holy Spirit, with only one class per grade. Our principal, Mrs. McAvoy, was a tall, broad, hefty Irish Bronx woman with a curly red fro. Every morning in the gym, before marching to the classrooms, we initiated our day with prayer and pledge in our school gym. Each grade slash class lined up in two lines with boys on the left and girls on the right. Grades one through four were set up on the right side of the gym and grades five through eight on the left side. HSS was painted in the middle of the varnished floor of the gym. Mrs. McAvoy holding a rosary of brown beads and the cross of huge significance that anyone in the gym could see, along with her brass bell that always reflected shine from the lights of the gym, stood in the middle of the gym, still facing the door as we lined up in our designated places. We lined up like soldiers, waiting for instructions. Once we were in our lines, she rang her bell and we quietly waited for her to greet us with Good morning, Holy Spirit students. We always responded with, good morning, Mrs. McAvoy. 
The whole school, grades one through eight, said good morning to Mrs. McAvoy in sing song unison. We started the rosary reciting 10 Hail Marys as Mrs. McAvoy's fingers went from one beat to the next, then concluded our prayer with, an, with one Our Father. After we honored Mary, Jesus, and God in that order, we ended our morning assembly putting our right hand on our chest to pledge allegiance to our flag, then sing praises to our country. We were dismissed from morning assembly grade by grade as we marched through the school to our classrooms. Divorces, abortions, and infidelities. I yearned for a time of lines, consistency, and order. I knew my line under a rosary, a brass bell, and Mrs. McAvoy. I now spend my life searching for lines under nothing. All right, so um, this is about, the next one is about my high school boyfriend. He and I still stay in touch, um, but he was my first love and um, adolescence, the growth, you know. So this one is called Leading Up To, and this is also another ode to the Bronx. When we shared a medium fries from McDee's a couple of years into our puberty, we walked through Cortona Park past the swimming pool cracked files and cracked walkways. Tall trees created our separated space. You tossed the empty red McDee's envelope and held my hand with playful care. Your hands, so soft that I fell, you led me to a scratched bench. We sat, smelling the chlorine and hearing the children from the pool. You had dreams, I had fantasies. You want it to be a seed carried away. I told you I was this bench. We are young, you said. Maybe you thought you would take this bench since I thought I would pan fry the bird destined to carry you away. Then it happened. Your lips tasted like biting into a ripe Southern Bronx peach. My arms hugged your neck. Your mouth hugged my breath. The strings of our pubertal energies danced between the branches above us. How long did we kiss? All right. <laughs> okay, now I'm I'm getting I'm becoming a vieja now. <laughs> this was called great pubic hair. <laughs> you crept out of nowhere, bitch. <laughs> you decided to appear there. I see you. Reminding me of the little deaths I barely have, dried by the big one sooner to come. <laughs> the next one is called, thank you so much. The next one is called First Mammogram. I am in the waiting room, wearing my pink hospital gown, waiting to be called. I watch shows about healthy options on food swaps and demonstrations of low impact exercises. I can take one third of the pasta of a mac and cheese recipe and use cauliflower instead. For chocolate chip cookies, I can use half the flour portion as whole wheat flour instead of white. I must move daily, according to this show, and do my estate planning and my will. A woman without hair walks into the waiting room. I'm not going to assume that her visit is a follow-up simply because of where we are and her being bald. I'm going to start my estate planning and add whole wheat flour to my shopping list. Nice. Very nice. <laughs> Thank you. Nice. Everybody give it up. Give it up. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sam and Sims. Just because we got to stay on that. But. No eres la vieja. Para nada. Para nada. I can, I can <laughs> listen to you read these poems all night, Joe. Trust me. Trust me. <laughs> Thank you so much for giving me the space and the, the time and for bringing me on to the family. I appreciate you so much. No doubt. Welcome to the family. Welcome to the family. Yeah. Um, 
Oh, muchas gracias. Oh, <laughs> you know, listen, you rocked it because Gail's dropping the Spanish and the whole shit. Like, you rocked yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Mañana mi libro es bilingüe. Ya verás. Mañana. Okay. Nice. All right. Um, we hanging in there. We making it. That's what's up. 24 people deep. Thank you, everybody, for hanging with us and visiting us tonight. We're also on Facebook Live, and we're getting, um, you know, some attention over there. So, wonderful. Last but definitely not least, definitely not least, is Carrie Salerno. Um, I just, I'm going to interject a little bit here and just say that um, just from... Uh, I was a reader for Alice James books. I think we all were at one point. Uh, all of us drew heads, right? Um, and just, I guess, seeing the way in which Carrie went about doing this. And just every time I met Carrie, she was like so nice and so sweet and chill and just like a regular person. I was like, you know what? I don't, I don't gotta be super extra if I wanna be a publisher. I think there's a way to do this where you could still be a normal person human being you know what i'm saying and you could you could still write books what wait a minute um you know that example i think and um this vision that alice james has right and the books they publish um it's just dope to you know be able to say hey i know you you know what i mean she's so chill and so cool and to look at alice james and be like yeah i love what they do um and you know i think I think it's just a wonderful kind of example out there in the world of, you know, how to be a publisher and kind of have a family in the same, I'm trying to do the same thing. You know what I mean? Um, a little differently, but obviously um, that's what it's about. So big up and props for that, for sure, for real, for real, right? Um, okay, now I'm gonna read your bio and, and get into all of this other stuff, sorry. Um, Okay, Carrie Salerno is, as we all know, the executive and badass of Alice James books. I gotta always change it up. I can't just read it how it is, right? She's the pinky in the brain of Alice James books. Like, uh, <laughs> you know, um, where she has been serving underrepresented voices in the liter literary community since 2008. She's also the author of Shelter and Tributary, come forthcoming from Percy Books in 2021. Please look out for that, y'all. And I want to say, uh, you know, drag her out from behind the desk of Alice James Books to come read with y'all uh, in all of the, the places and the stuff, because I often have to make sure I keep posting stuff to let people know I'm a poet, too. I write, too, you know. So we're, you know, we, we're publishing the voices that we want to read. But then at the same time, we got stuff we're trying to say, too. So uh, show some love, everybody. Okay for Carrie Salerno. Oh, thank you so much. I, I'm just so thrilled uh, to be part of this uh, amazing lineup of Get Fresh Book writers tonight. And, um, and Roberto, I, uh, you know, you're like, I want this family, I want this community. And, and like, it is, you're doing it. This is, this is it right here. I mean, it just feels so good. Um, hearing all of these amazing voices and um, and and the and the range and the heart uh, that's on the list um, and uh, and it's really incredible and I feel so honored to just be part of um, the the Get Fresh experience tonight. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, so um, you know I uh, I wanted to just share really briefly about the book that I'm reading. Um, uh, it's called Unworthy Republic. I don't know if anyone has heard of this book. Um, it's the, the subtitle of it is The Dispossession um, of Native Americans and the Road to Indian Territory. And, um, you know, in my time when I'm not reading poetry, I am a nonfiction person. So that's, you know, also um, uh, one of my fun facts about <laughs> about me, or maybe it's not fun, I don't know. Um, but uh, but I just wanted to share that too. Uh, and I have the chat open, so, um, you know, I can see everything that's coming through. Oh, yeah, thanks, Darla, totally fun fact. Yeah, thank you, <laughs> I appreciate that. 
<laughs> I feel a little nerdy about it, but it also just feels so good. Um, I don't know. I just I, I love reading it. And, and this book is is really incredibly amazing. And um, it really does uh, give a lot of history and a lot of understanding to what happened in the 1830s when um, when we made this uh, landslide. Um, uh, you know, it's like the first, you know, state, huge state sponsored uh, effort to um, to basically move Native Americans and displace. Uh, uh, tens of thousands of people from the land that they called home and just push them someplace else. Um, so, you know, it's something that we've done and it's something that we do. And uh, so read it, you know, in your, in your free time, <laughs> put it on your list. <laughs> Uh, okay, so Roberto mentioned that I have a new book coming out and that's Tributary. Um, just want to say a couple words about it. Uh, the title um, sort of acts as a, a double entendre. So, you know, the tribute, uh, tributary as someone, a person who pays tribute to a ruler, um, but also a river or a stream um, that flows and feeds a larger body of water. So, um, these poems uh, function in that way, um, both having, you know, the book has like a, a stricter structure, but it also has a fluidity coming through the river. Um, you'll hear when I read some of the poems, um, a lot of them are addressed to the river. And um, the poems are also a discourse about family fracture and fanatical religiosity and also um, delving into systems of whiteness and um, and thinking more in, inside of those systems, what the system's um, whiteness needs in order to protect itself, um, you know, and and how um, and how those those functions sort of play out um, in 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 how we raise how we're raised and how we raise. Um, so I'll open with uh, the invocation. Oh, thanks, Lynn. Can't wait for this up. Yep, me too. Here we go. <laughs> okay, invocation. River, what are you? Song of water too pretty for the mouth, finger to scrawl. Place we drink from, place we drown. River above my head, daring to pour down all the family secret, this wet invisible crown, where in the ear the words are channel and resound, resound, and sound, and sound. The dirty chamber shutting the mouth, its levee impound, its rain hammering, its round, a river above my head making no sound. The secret in, not ever out, bound, it's bound, unbound. River, what are you? River I drink from river in which I drown. All right, so um, I kind of feel like that poem is in conversation with this other one um, called Impatient with the River. And, uh, and oh, thank you, Lynn, thanks. Oh, thank you, Anana. Oh, oh, and Shara, thank you. Hi, Shara, hi. Um, so uh, this one is called Impatient with the River. It's um, it's a sequence. And so, uh, you know, I'll just pause between um, the sequences, you know, as per usual with us poets. <laughs> um, okay, Impatient with the River. Speak the name of the river. Who levels stone like hungry ears slurping gossip in the antechamber? Speak the name of the one who stones, that lodges in the throat, River. River, tell me your family name, Ku. River, I said, I want to know it, Fist. River, I'm waiting by your wild silk spun bank with my hands open and you will place an offering what I want to fill this infertile ground. 
River, what is the name you go by? To what may I refer? To whom? What deep in your bedrock eroding? What yawning beneath the floodwater covers awakened? Or in slumber, drifting between the rooms of our house like water, rippling between the stories and leaving white shadow wood, the stairwell, damp and rank. River, will you never speak? River, no other name than, no other more frustrating than fuck name. River, ephemeral, swear to answer, weather with snowmelt, the hundred year flood, a drought I can disappear into. Swear to telegraph, telepath your name, and I'll bury deep in your salt blanched mud where I confess even where I have the right to remain, here I cannot wait. It's so quiet. It's so quiet with the mute. <laughs> we are like, we are wrapped listening right now. That's what we do, you know? I think it's good. It's like, it's like, I'm. I'm still, I'm still getting used to the Zoom world. It's like um, so visual. Oh, thank you, thank you, Jesse. Oh, thanks, Shara. Oh, thank you, Andrews Galaxy S twenty plus five G. <laughs> I'm Kathy. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, I'll. I want to read this. Um, this poem. Um, that I wrote for my sister, my older sister. Uh, so it's a poem, um, it's called Postpartum Depression. And then it has a bunch of subtitles that are basically like the, um, the synonyms to postpartum depression because I find them so silly. Uh, unhappiness, um, I guess despair isn't silly, but unhappiness just seems a little light. Um, sadness, downheartedness, it's like the downhearted. Um, misery, hopelessness, melancholy, that's I think pretty good. Uh, dejection, I'm not sure where that one comes from. Gloominess and, and slump, um, all don't seem really to, to fit, but, um, but here's the poem. I want to course down the Ramapo, the Wanaku, the stream that feeds it, which has no name I know, to the creek cutting the deep wood behind your house and your garden and the chickens being carried away by the neighbor's loose bloodhound baying over their broke neck bodies. Over the hundred year floodplain and the crying of children who mourn the chickens and hold the rest of the flock close to their bodies, the heat of their pounding blood speaking the language of warmth between them. When you call me and say, you think the children are better off without you. You think sometimes I want to be the Delaware swift and direct tributary to your body of water. What you are, what you cry into the shower drain if you are able to shower alone. My sister, do not think the children cannot see how you show them the truest kindness as you slip the lead over the murdering creature and tie it next to the chicken coop as you go to fetch the neighbor to repeat the dog has again gone loose your son saying he hates the dog and you saying i know but try not to stay angry for too long and you too sister let go of whatever ruddy water your body, your body stays. Run to the hard rain and let it soak your skin with its offering. Watch for me in the water as the river, as river rising. Um, so how am I, I'm like reacting with no, with no sound, but I'm unmuted, so. 
It's all good. You're doing great. <laughs> um, so uh, I think I'll do maybe two, maybe two more. Three more. Okay, I'll do three more. Okay. All right. So this is um, the river as body of water apportioning. And this is also uh, a sequence. Um, <clears throat> and the title runs into the first line. The river as body of water apportioning, mind you, is flammable water, a feeding lie, a feathery neon pink hook before which I think to open my wet jaw. But instead, when the father speaks, I only wander within his speech acts startling river, body of water apportioning, treading with and against the current, secret river, raging river, Rivers, immutable spiriting of all injustice, straight out to see what really is it made of? If I am your daughter lost at the plunge of my burning mouth into whatever liquid was made available, the rule that steadies even my tongue smolder, a thumb pressed meant to drown out these smarting embers, then you, are the heat source of my insolent speech. If I am the victim of the burn, spared by the one who inflicts the burn, you are the one who hides the ointment that would give relief. Here it comes, here it comes. Touch the river water, the confines of its one rushing line, body of water apportioning like all else in that it's unlike all else. What comes forth from my mouth is not green now, but more rushing and not minnow, but silt, but seared flesh resting atop the mind, a blanket for safekeeping where the water will find itself not on, not above, but through. All right. Okay, I'm going to read this poem um, <laughs> about a baptism that uh, that I underwent as a child. It was like really deeply scarring for me. <laughs> um, and and I think the poem pretty much explains why um, it was just really weird. Uh, it's like I don't know. I don't know when you're a kid like how to have a baptism and you don't really want to. And I I tried to run away. Uh, it didn't work. Bapt baptism with a pond in it. There's a, there was a gross, I don't even know if you could call it a pond. It was more like, I don't know what it was. Water in somebody's backyard. Like weird. <clears throat> okay, baptism with a pond in it. I saw my sister resurrect wet and shining and applauded and spun to sprint up the hill from the pond but the water sweet, dumb and warm still and the preacher's thumb and finger clamped, pushed my body into what was made to bring me closer to body of water apportioning where the only water roaring was quick to suffocate my face. I closed my eyes and searched for the river and there only could place my father drunk unspooling me like a carpet into the water, his arm a firm cane, forcing the body in. But how I wanted to stay below, void of sound and drums full cello, void of white bright, the body's buoyant bellow, an evervescing halo, a, an ocean swelling the capillary and narrow. What was the sin for what to atone as a child in drenched Sunday robes who wept? The hope of transformation and not for any joy nor salvation. Dear father, what arrives suddenly in a dirty moat, a preacher's sodden bay. Even the fish won't take up residence. Let us pray. What's left in the water will not wash away.
All right. <clears throat> Last one. A lot of these, yeah, a lot of these, <laughs> my um, inside of my family, I have family members that don't talk to one another, but I have two family members that like really love fishing. And I always think to myself, like if they could just get to fish together, like if they could just get in the water together, like maybe they would talk. Um, it's my, my secret wish, one of my secret wishes, not so secret wish. <clears throat> All right, so, um, so this is, this is a poem um, about, about finding, finding a place. Um, and I, and I, and um, one of the people is, is my brother and, and he's, uh, he's a fisher and he loves fly fishing and river fishing. And he, not only does he love doing these things, but he loves finding like the secret spots. So in Michigan, where I grew up, there are all these secret fishing spots and, um, and, you know, he loves, you know, the, the places where you have to get the verbal directions and, and you could make it there or you could not, and no one will give you a map and, you know, no one will write it down because they don't really want anybody to know. So this poem is um, also kind of based off of, off of that lore and that life. It's called Of Secrets, Secret River guide me there, guide me home. Only the certain anglers know this secret river, know the path leading to its waters, trust in the purity, the bounty of gleaming, of fish gleaming from the frame of the Instagram feed. What trails are ones you know? What roads diverged in a yellow wood. Tell it to the river with her mouth open for the wet kiss. Tell it to the river haunted by her bounty of fish. Gleaming near the bank, spawning near the bank. Only the anglers know the way to her, the way to keep her hidden, the way under the bramble to her mushy bottom the way to sink into and pull from her bounty of gleaming fish, her bounty of secrets. Oh yes, do not forget that. Secret river, guide me there, guide me home. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We can all unmute now. So Carrie is really, like really listening. <laughs> oh. Beautiful. So beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, we see you, everybody. Dime lo tigera. So let me make a gallery view. So I want to thank everybody, uh, not just for reading, but everybody for being here. Um, you know, feel free to unmute and chit chat if you want for a few minutes. I know it's tough to like not. Um, thank you again, uh, Kathy, Len, Darla, Mercy, Carrie, uh, for being here, for reading your wonderful work, right? Um, Ananda says, I seem super professional with Zoom. <laughs> Ananda, you're so kind. I'm so glad you're here because now I feel a little bit better. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> about what I did. Um, thank you, everybody. I won't keep y'all. Um, you know what I'm saying? Mad love. Thanks for being here. And we'll see you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you for supporting uh, what we're trying to do. Love you guys. You, Roberto. Thank you. So Hi, everyone. Thank you. Adios. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, everybody.